Armageddon and the setting up of the kingdom by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to take the easy part of this first, but just initially we, we need to establish, I believe, uh, the importance of the subject before us. The future role of the saints, that is those who are glorified by Christ at his coming, is to rule for a thousand years as kings and priests with him. And this is one of the dominant subjects of the book of Revelation. And we're going to find as we go a little later on to Revelation chapter 20 that that subject is there right to the end of the scripture. The promise is held out that those who are found worthy at the return of Christ will become kings and priests and will share the rulership of the earth for a thousand years in his presence. Now in fact this subject begins in our Bibles way back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 14, which is why we've read that chapter this evening. And there's a principle that we're going to use tonight, because if those who are found worthy are going to be kings and priests, then they need to have established something in their preparation. The proverb says this, Proverbs 25 verse 2, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. In other words, God expects people who are going to rule the earth for a thousand years to have done some study of his word, to have dug deep into it and to discover some of its secrets because those secrets will motivate them. They will give them the faith and the perception and the vision that will enable them to walk in a way today that will ensure their future tomorrow. So that's the principle involved here. God conceals things in his word because, of course, he only wants a certain class of people to understand it. Now, if you think that's probably a little bit too much, just let me remind you of what the Lord Jesus Christ said on the very first day that he taught in parables. He spoke the parable of the sower, the first and most well-known parable in the scripture. And his disciples came to him immediately afterwards and said, Why do you teach in parables? And he said this, and I'll paraphrase it, Because I want you, the disciples, to understand, but I don't want them, the Jews, who weren't prepared to exercise their minds, to understand. So he deliberately spoke in parables so that some would understand and some wouldn't. And God does that in the Word. He hides certain things so that only those who apply their minds, who have a key to unlock it, will discover those wonderful truths. So we're going to use that principle here tonight. We're going to talk about types and shadows. And this is a theme of the Bible that is probably not given as much room as it ought to occupy. Types and shadows. What does the word type mean? Well, here's the, here's the Webster Dictionary description of this word type. Latin, typus. Greek, from the root of tap, to beat, strike, or impress. So you want to make a type or a pattern. Let's say you've got plasticine. You bash it with something. You make a cavity. And that then, you can pour something into that. And so what you get out of that is the same shape as the cavity. So it's a type. It's the mark of something, an emblem, that, that which represents something else. A sign a symbol, a figure of something to come. As Abraham's sacrifice and the Paschal or Passover lamb were types of Christ. Now, in other words, when you read these stories back in the Old Testament about what Abraham did and how Israel kept the Passover before they left Egypt, they were actually <laughs> types of something else. In this case, as he says, types of the sacrifice of Christ. So this word is opposed anti-type. Christ, in this case, is the anti-type. So if you have a type, it's a shadow, a pattern of something to come. But when that substance comes along, when the reality appears, then that's called the anti-type over against the type. So here's the type, the substance comes along, it's the anti-type. So that's a definition of what we mean by types and shadows. And the Bible is full of them. Now if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to join me in 1st of Corinthians chapter 15. This is that very long chapter that deals with resurrection. 
The Apostle Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 15 by saying this in verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, now that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now the Scriptures he's referring to here are the only ones that were extant when he wrote. That is, the Old Testament Scriptures. So he says Scriptures meaning the books of the Old Testament. Now, the disciples of Christ had the Old Testament, but one thing they did not fully understand is that he had to be crucified. Paul says that was all there in the Old Testament, along with something else, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So if you can find me any place in the Old Testament that Christ had to, to rise from the dead on the third day, please show me. Because I know of no statement in the Old Testament that says that Christ would rise after three days and three nights in the earth, in the tomb. But he did. And you can only establish that from the Old Testament by types. Without types, you would not know that he would be raised in three days. But there is a type, isn't there? And it's the type of Jonah. So you can't establish the fact that Paul's talking about the resurrection of Christ on the third day without the story of Jonah. And in, in the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 17, that's exactly what you read about Jonah. He was swallowed up by a huge fish, probably a whale, and that whale spat him out on the shore after three days and three nights. It's a well-known story. Hence, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 says this, For as Jonas, or Jonah, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, that is himself, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So you see, the Lord Jesus Christ himself uses the story of Jonah to teach that he would only be in the tomb for three days and three nights. Without a type, you can't establish that. So that's how important types are in the scheme of things. You might like to join me now in Revelation chapter 20. This is one of those passages that we had on the screen a little earlier about kings and priests. So let's just read these two verses, verses 4 and 6 of Revelation 20. It says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. <clears throat> and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So if you're a priest and you're reigning with Christ on his throne, then you're a king priest. Kings and priests. Now this is the song that the redeemed sing in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. What we're not told back there is for how long. We are told here, in these two verses, that it's for a thousand years. And guess what? It's the only place in the Bible that states it in as many words. How would you know that Christ was going to reign for a thousand years prior to this book being delivered? And we believe it was delivered to John on the Isle of Patmos in AD 96. So how would God's servants know prior to AD 96, that there would be a millennium. Because the only place in the Word of God is right at the end of the Bible. Well, you can do it with types. And only by types and shadows. And you can go right back to the first two chapters of the Bible, where we have the record of the creation of the world as we know it in six days, and in the seventh day, which is the story of Genesis chapter 2, the angels whom God had sent to create the earth rested and Adam and Eve took over the role of managing the affairs. 
of that new creation. Adam and Eve didn't keep the Sabbath, by the way. They worked. It wasn't hard labour, but they worked while the angels rested. And that sets the pattern for what is to come. Because there will be 6,000 years of human history and in the seventh millennium, Christ and his bride, just like Adam and Eve in the first instance, will rule over the earth, over all carnal things, just as Adam and Eve did on the seventh day. So only by using the rule that is given to us in the second of Peter chapter 3 verse 8 can we establish from the Old Testament that there would be a millennium of 1,000 years. Peter's principle is this. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So when you take the first six days, followed by a seventh of rest, and you use that principle, you have 6,000 years of human history, and that's up, by the way, we're at, we're at the end of it. And then you have a seventh, a day of rest, a millennium. And in that millennium, Christ shares his rulership with his bride, and they rule with him as kings and priests. That's the pattern that was set, but only by types and shadows in the Old Testament. So I think we might have established the principles on which we're now going to talk about Genesis chapter 14. Now in that reading that Dave did for us in Genesis 14, in verse 18 we read these words. It's one of only two references to a man called Melchizedek in the Old Testament. There are nine others in the New Testament and we'll talk about those in a moment. This is the first reference in the Bible to this Melchizedek. <laughs> Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, we read. Now his name means king of righteousness. It consists of two Hebrew words. Melech, that is, king, and Zedek, or Zadok, which means righteousness. So he's a king of righteousness. And there's a clear hint, of course, of a greater one to come. So Melchizedek is a type. He's a shadow of a greater man to come. Now that's clearly going to be our Lord Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 72 verse 1, we read this. Of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David. It's David's last psalm. And he says this. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. So the one who's going to reign over the earth is a king of righteousness. And he proved himself to be righteous in his mortal probation. So straight away we can see that Genesis chapter 14 is going to teach us something about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we read in Genesis chapter 14 that he was king of Salem. Now the Salem here is in fact Jerusalem. But there's a reason why the name Salem is used and not Jerusalem. And we'll see that in a moment. Jerusalem, says the Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 35, is the city of the great king, that is, himself, this king of righteousness. So we're beginning to build a picture here, aren't we? Here is Melchizedek, king of Salem. And we find in that 18th verse of Genesis 14 that he comes out to meet Abraham who's just returned victorious over, over a massive northern confederacy in a conflict that surely should have been the other way around if it was just a human conflict. But he comes back victorious over this massive army that's decimated that entire land and he meets this priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, in a valley, in the Vale of the King, as we're going to see in a moment. And Melchizedek comes out, he blesses Abraham, and he distributes bread and wine. Now, I don't need to tell anyone here that bread and wine are the tokens of the sacrifice of Christ. That in the upper room, before he was crucified, our Lord Jesus Christ shared bread and wine with his disciples. So again, there's another clear hint that this is about something 
much more important than the circumstances in which Abraham was involved back there in Genesis chapter 14. It was a type, a foreshadowing of greater things to come. So why is this place, Jerusalem, called Salem in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18? Well, Jerusalem means the vision of peace. If you're having a vision of something, you're looking down the track. It's a vision of things to come. When we read it here, it's Salem, which is fascinating. Because Salem is the name of Jerusalem in the millennial age. And we know that from Psalm 76 verses 1 to 3, which say amongst other things this. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle. And the tabernacle being referred to is this building, this one mile square or 1.6 kilometres. This is America, isn't it? So I'll just talk about miles. One mile square building which surrounds an exalted Mount Zion. And this will be the result of the great earthquake that will happen at the time of Armageddon. It's the subject matter of Zechariah chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. That great earthquake will exalt Mount Zion. It will remove all of what you see there in Jerusalem today. And a massive temple will be built around that mountain, one mile square, and will become a house of prayer for all nations. It's a subject that is quite common throughout the word of God. It goes on to say in his dwelling place in Zion. So here it is. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword, and the battle. In other words, he's saying, this has come about because of Armageddon. We're going to talk about what Armageddon is in a moment. This has come about because of the battle of Armageddon and its consequences, the changes to the land, the changes to the people, and this is a place in which God will be glorified by all mankind. And it's called Salem. Well, you see, the vision part will be gone then. It will just then be peace, which is this word Salem. That's what it means. Peace. Peace will have been established in the earth when Christ rules on the throne of David in that place. So let's come back and have a look in more detail at Genesis chapter 14, shall we? Let's just step back one verse to verse 17. It says this, after this battle and the victory of Abraham and his company over the confederacy of Kedalaoma, we read in verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedalaoma, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. So it's called the king's dale. Very interesting. What king do you think? Well, the king of the next verse. Melchizedek king of Salem. This was his valley. And recently, about 12 months ago, a group of us were there sitting in that valley. It's a fascinating place given its future, as you're going to see in a moment. It's called a dale, which just means a vale or a valley. And it's called Shava. That means plain or a level plain from the root Shava, which means to level, that is to equalize, to bring something up to another level. To the, to the same level as something else. And that's fascinating when you take into account the Apostle Paul's words, and we'll, in a moment we'll go to Hebrews chapter 7, but he says this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3, of Melchizedek. He says, Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. The Son of God being Christ, of course. So Melchizedek is presented in the Scripture has been made like unto the Son of God. You notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that Christ was made like Melchizedek. Christ is the substance. Melchizedek is the shadow, the type. And he was made like Christ. What does that tell you? It tells us this. That Christ was in the mind of God well and truly before Melchizedek. And when Melchizedek came on the scene and, and was appointed by God as his priest, he was made like unto the one that God was going to provide in due time when he would raise up his son in the fourth millennium after the creation. Melchizedek 
was therefore a type of Christ. And as great as he was, and we're going to see how great he was, his name only occurs 11 times in Scripture. And 11 is the number of incompleteness. So as great as this man was, he was not as great as the substance of whom he was a type. And that, of course, is a very important thing. The, the substance, the antitype, is always going to be greater and more important than the shadow that points forward to him. So this Melchizedek, as we said, his name in the Hebrew language means king of righteousness. As I said, it occurs 11 times, twice in the Old Testament and nine in the New Testament. Now just come along to the book of Hebrews, which is at the other end of the Bible, Hebrews chapter 7. In fact, the book of Hebrews contains the other nine occurrences of this name Melchizedek, beginning in chapter 5. And it's probably not a bad exercise if you want something interesting to do. It's just to highlight this name Melchizedek. It begins in chapter 5 and verse 6 with a quotation from Psalm 110 verse 4. It's repeated in verse 10 of chapter 5. And then you've got to come to the end of chapter 6 to verse 20. And then you find it in the first verse of Hebrews chapter 7. And then again in verse 10. And in verse 11, in verse 15, in verse 17, and in verse 21. So it's, it's used quite frequently here, nine times in fact, in the book of Hebrews. And the Apostle Paul gives an explanation as he talks about this Melchizedek. Let's read from verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 7. He says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all to acknowledge his superiority, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, the meaning of his name, and after that also king of Salem, his residence, which is, by interpretation, king of peace. Now there's a principle involved here, and that's the principle expressed in many places in the Bible. Places like James 3.17, Isaiah 48 verse 22 where God says there is no peace to the wicked. There is no rest to the wicked. Places like Isaiah 32 verse 1 and 16 and 17 that the effect of righteousness will be peace. Places like Psalm 72 that we've quoted already verses 1 to 7 where the message is clear that where you do not have righteousness you can never have peace. You can only have peace when there's righteousness. And that's what baptism's all about. Baptism is about acknowledging the righteousness of God as a basis for the forgiveness of sins. And then men and women can have fellowship with God. Can't get it before that. So you must have righteousness. If you want peace, it's the only way. It's the, it's the biblical, the divine method. And without it, there will be no peace. And that's why he's first king of righteousness, then king of peace. Simple but very important principle expressed in the word of God. But we read on in verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Now this sounds as though he's not human. But Melchizedek was very human. What Paul is saying is that when God presents the picture of this man in Genesis 14, he tells you nothing about his father or his mother. He must have had a father and mother. Nothing about his genealogy at all. Nor about his death. So he's presented in a way that is to represent someone much greater than himself. He's made like unto the Son of God. He's going to point forward to someone much greater than himself. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who had a heavenly father. No human father, only a human mother. And of course, who was raised from the dead and is ever living. He's immortal now, at the right hand of God. He's coming back to rule for God on earth. So when Melchizedek is taken as a vehicle 
by God as a shadow or a type of Christ. Certain things are left out of the record so that he might point forward to the greater one who was to come. That's the principle the Apostle Paul is talking about. So at the end of verse 3 he says, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was. Yes, he was truly great. Unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And he, he then says this in the final sentence of this verse, and without all contradiction, the less, the inferior, is blessed of the better, the superior. You don't have children, or at least you shouldn't have children, blessing adults. You shouldn't have a son blessing a father. So you don't have the less blessing the better, so to speak, or the superior. You have the superior blessing the lesser. And that's exactly what happened here. So who's the greatest? Who's the one that's more important in the scheme of things? Abraham or Melchizedek? Well, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. That makes Melchizedek the greater. And that's why he comes out with bread and wine. He is prefiguring the work of Christ who would die in order that mankind might be redeemed on the principles of acknowledging the righteousness of God comes out with bread and wine which of course we don't need to establish are the tokens of the new or the Abrahamic covenant that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of in the upper room this is the blood of the new covenant and by new covenant he meant Abrahamic covenant it was new because it was only going to be ratified by his sacrifice. Even though it was much older than the Mosaic law, it had not been ratified by blood. That was to happen in the sacrifice of Christ. That's why it was called new. And in Acts chapter 3, we learn what this is all about. I'd like you to come back to Acts chapter 3 now and just have a quick look at what God promised Abraham and those who would come into Abraham. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is wrapping up his speech to thousands of Jews. And here we find him saying, in verses 25 and 26 of Acts 3, these words, Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham. And here comes a quotation from Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18, which is the seventh and final and unconditional promise that God made to Abraham. He says, And in thy seed, which we know from Galatians chapter 3 verse 16, is Christ, and in thy seed, and in thy seed Christ shall all the kindreds or families of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, you Jews, Having God having raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Now that's very important to us that passage of scripture because it gives us a clue. If you know anything about the promises made to Abraham they are crucial to an understanding of the hope of the gospel that can lead to eternal life without understanding and believing those promises there is no hope and when God made his promise to Abraham he said things like this and I will bless thee moreover he said I will bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee and in thy seed and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed what does he mean by blessed well did he mean that Somehow someone would pass on, you know, a priestly, a, like a, a minister's blessing in a church? Did he mean that? I mean, someone stand there and say, I bless you. As though that was going to change anything in your life? Of course not. It's got nothing to do with that kind of blessing. It's got everything to do with God turning people's lives around. 
And that's why it says here in Acts 3, verse 26, because he's actually explaining the passage that's quoted from Genesis 22 and verse 18. And to you first, the Jews, the natural seed of Abraham, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. How? In turning away every one of you from your iniquities. And that takes a lifetime. It takes a lifetime for God to work in people's lives through the power of his word, the example of his son, to turn people's lives entirely around, to turn them away from iniquity. That's what he means by blessing. So if you grasp hold of the promises to Abraham, God promises that if you work with him, he will work with you to turn you away from your iniquities. And if you're turned away from your iniquities, what have you got? Righteousness. And what do you get from righteousness? Peace. And you get more than that. Because if you're found faithful at the return of Christ, you will share his rule with him as kings and priests. And he will be the antitype, the fulfillment of the type of Melchizedek. He will be the great king of righteousness who will rule the world in peace with those who are kings and priests with him. It's a very, very important subject in the Bible. So where is this valley of Shava that we read of back here in Genesis chapter 14? <coughs> well, what you're looking at there is a topographical map of Mount Zion, which is here. You can actually see the word Zion. If you had a pair of binoculars from the back, you could see the word Zion is right there. Now this is Jerusalem of today, old Jerusalem of today. And over here you have the Temple Mount in that section there. Now most of us of course are familiar with what you immediately meet once you leave the Temple Mount and you head east. To the east of you is the Mount of Olives. But between you, if you're standing on the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, there's a valley, isn't there? It's called the Kidron Valley, and Christ crisscrossed it many times. And the last time, of course, was on the way to the cross, at least on the way to his trials that led to the cross. And that Kidron Valley is also called in the Bible the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And we'll come to the Valley of Jehoshaphat in a moment. So it's this valley, this depression that runs past the Temple Mount, here, that red line. Now, what has been superimposed over that topographical map is the block plan of the Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy. That one mile square temple that we were talking about. It has two rows of buildings in this square format. So there's an outer row and there's an inner row with a court in between them. There are four massive corner towers of 480 feet high and there is an inner circular sanctuary which surrounds, or will eventually surround, the exalted Mount Zion, which will be the most holy place upon earth when this is established after Armageddon and the tidying up of the land and the building of this house. It will take some 40 years to construct it. Now, the point of, the point of this little exercise is this. Abraham, when he returned from his victory over the northern confederacy met Melchizedek in this valley here the valley of the Kidron and Melchizedek brought out to his company that we're going to see in a moment with Jew and Gentile he brought out bread and wine the tokens of the sacrifice of Christ guess what's going to happen when this building is a reality and sits right there with its eastern court this is its eastern court running down where the valley of Jehoshaphat or the Kidron Valley runs today. Guess what's going to happen there? Well, we're going to find out what happens there. Because this is the eastern row of buildings. This one here is sitting where the valley of the Kidron is today. Okay? 
And this is the place where Christ will reside for 1,000 years. He won't leave it. He's going to enter from the east gate, we are told, in Ezekiel chapter 44, 43 and 44. And when he enters, the gates will be shut. They will not be opened ever again. Because he's not going to leave this building for a thousand years. He's the glory. He will send out his saints to do their work in the earth, but he will remain here, except to worship on Mount Zion. So it describes in Ezekiel 45, 46, the prince crossing over from this eastern court, the hundred cubits of the pavement here, into this section of buildings on his way to Mount Zion, which is over here, to the left. Okay? He's going to make sacrifices. He makes, they're prepared for him here. He's going to worship here. Then he will cross over and go into the circular sanctuary. But what's he going to do? For most of the time he's in here. Well, this eastern court with its two rows of cellae, halls with three levels. There's three levels here. Is the place of the priest. He resides in the house. And here also he dines with the saints in the upper galleries of the outer range. I want you to have a look at Luke chapter 12, 35 and to 40. And then 22 verse 18. So let's start in Luke chapter 12. So what do we read in Luke 12, verse 35? He says, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves make unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he, he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meat or food, and will come forth and serve them. Really? Is this the great king that we read about in Matthew 5, 35? Is this the king of righteousness who sits upon David's throne? Yes, it's the same one. The one who got up at the table and girded himself with a towel and took a bowl of water and washed his disciples' feet is the one described here. He's going to make his saints, his fellow kings and priests, sit down in the galleries, in the halls of this easternmost row of buildings. He's going to go around and serve them. And more than that, He's actually going to have special meetings to do something else. Come along to Luke chapter 22 and verse 18. Luke 22, 18. Here he is in the upper room with his disciples and he's offering them bread and wine. It says in verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. So what else is he going to do here? Seeing that this is where he lives. He's going to have special meetings in which he will go around like Melchizedek did in Genesis 14 and offer bread and wine to those who are privileged to sit there in that place with him. Who are they? Well, kings and priests. They're sharing his rule. They're immortal beings. That's the reward that is held out for those who will be there in that day. And guess where this is? Exactly. In the very same place where Melchizedek met Abraham and his company returning from their victory over the Northern Confederacy. Accident, do you think? Don't think so. And I think what you can see from that is that what we have in Genesis 14 is a remarkable, pristine type of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, his future work in establishing the kingdom of God and performing what Melchizedek does in type back there in the record of Genesis chapter 14. So 
that's really all introductory. Because I'm going to now talk about how we get to that point.